hard to believe it's been nearly three years since the first video on Petski Robots. Yep, that was back in 2020. And since then, I have made five videos on the topic, uh, covering the various ports that have been in the works up to this point. And um, this list here represents the versions that have been complete and available for some time. And I have five new versions I'm going to talk about in this episode. These include the MS-DOS, Atari 7800, Super Nintendo, and two unusual systems, the Auric Atmos and the Enterprise 128. Sit back because this is going to be a long one. So after I show you the final five versions of the game, then I'm going to talk a little bit about the abandoned versions and I'm going to talk about sales figures for all the different ports. I'm going to talk about um, a potential sequel to Petsky Robots. Oh, and I'm going to tell you how to win some prizes by playing Petsky Robots. And then I'm going to talk about why I'm probably going to phase out merchandise sales altogether. So there's a lot to talk about. And I'll start by inviting everyone to come to Vintage Computer Festival Southwest, which is going to be right here in the Dallas area. It's going to take place in June in the Davis and Gundy Illumini Center uh, in Richardson, Texas, actually. And uh, I'm going to be there on Friday doing the VIC-20 repair workshop that I've talked about doing before. So um, I've got a lot of spare VIC-20 parts, and so I encourage everyone to bring their broken VIC-20s. And uh, we're going to spend about three hours on Friday just repairing any VIC-20s we can repair for, you know, free of charge. So bring those along. On uh, Saturday, I'll be at my regular booth, and then I will be doing a panel on Sunday with Kevin Williams about the Commander X-16. So I look forward to seeing all you guys there. Okay, let's go over the final five versions of the game, starting with the Auric, not to be confused with Orac. <laughs> it's quite an unusual machine, and uh, when Doosan and Simon approached me about doing a port for the Auric, I had to go look it up and see what it even was. Um, I'd never even heard of it. Um, apparently, it's a British computer which was supposed to compete with the Sinclair ZX Spectrum, but uh, seemed to be somewhat of a flop in the market. But uh, it runs on a 6502 processor and has up to 48K of RAM, which makes it a good candidate for a conversion. The Oryx video system is quite unique. I mean, technically, it can display eight colors, but the way the colors have to be defined you can only have a few colors per scan line, so there's no really good way to be able to have each tile presented in its own color. So the developers opted to just use black and white for the tiles. However, they did sprinkle around colors in other areas on the screen. The main game actually runs in text mode, so it uses a lot of the same code from the original Commodore version, but uh, the characters are only six pixels wide, so they had to redraw the characters the best they could. The title screen is in high res mode, but uh, color is still very limited for the same reason. Um, also you will hear the title music being played on the AY3 sound generator, but uh, there really isn't enough RAM available to have music during gameplay, so instead you hear the little pitter patter of feet walking just like we did on the Commodore Plus 4 version. The on screen map also looks really nice, uh, which is uh, drawn in high res mode, and they went the extra mile and created a small 4 pixel representation for each tile. So despite being monochrome, you can kind of tell the difference between things like grass and water, for example. Overall, the Oric version is fairly impressive in the context of the type of games you normally see on the machine. And uh, since my cost on this port was zero, uh, we decided just to give this version away for free to the Oric community, so the full game can be downloaded for free from my website. So, uh, moving on to another somewhat rare computer, the Enterprise 128. This is a Z80 based computer and it has some uh, really interesting graphics modes as well. There's actually two versions of the game, one that runs in attribute mode and then one that I'm showing here which runs in bitmap graphics. And uh, what you're seeing here is the artwork that was originally designed for the Commodore 128 version. And that's because the artwork was a good fit for the 160 by 200 resolution mode. Now, while it does have higher resolution modes, you'd have to drop to four colors. The game actually looks pretty amazing on this system, and um, as you can hear, they also converted the entire soundtrack for every level uh, over to the three voice PSG. Unfortunately, uh, the tempo is a little slower on this system since it runs at 50 hertz instead of 60, which is how the soundtrack was designed. And of course, there's a full color on screen map as well. I'm not really sure what else to say about this version other than they did an amazing job here as well. And uh, just like the Oryx system, there was zero cost to me other than a little beta testing here and there, so this version is also available for free. And I also wanted just to show you this uh, little mini arcade machine. Uh, this was created by James, who runs a YouTube channel called Print and Play. 
And he did a whole episode on the design and making of this guy, and uh, once he was finished, uh, he sent it to me. So uh, I've been keeping him right up there at the top shelf of my studio, uh, as it's about the only place it'll fit. So you've probably already seen him a few times uh, above my head in previous episodes and didn't realize it. Okay, now it's time to talk about the MS-DOS version. In the long run, this will probably wind up being the most popular version of the game, if Planet X3 is any indicator. And uh, when we start the game, you'll see quite a few options for graphics modes. There are two primary issues when it comes to supporting multiple graphics cards uh, for MS-DOS machines. Now, one obvious issue is that somebody has to write the code uh, to support the different cards because the registers and the memory layout are completely different uh, from one card to the next. So there's that problem. But another more overlooked problem is that of graphics assets. So uh, you, you ideally, you would need a custom artwork for each mode. So when considering machines like the Apple II or the Commodore 64, generally you only need one set of artwork and one set of routines to put that artwork on the screen. But in the world of MS-DOS, it's almost like you are making multiple ports of the same game. Now, historically, there have been two ways of handling the artwork situation. Now, one option is to have the artist simply draw the same graphics for each different video mode. Now, that can be time-consuming and expensive if you're having to pay the artist to do that. The other way you can do it is with a sort of automated conversion where you have a single graphics set and then you have code designed to try to down-convert those graphics or up-convert those graphics to um, different modes. Now, the problem with doing the automated conversion is that that means some of the graphics cards are going to suffer. And what I mean by that is uh, even though those, like, for example, converting VGA to CGA, sure, the CGA card is obviously inferior to VGA, but at the same time, you're not even providing graphics for CGA that even live up to the potential of what CGA could even do. So they're just, uh, they're not living up to their potential. Now with Petsky Robots, we actually used both methods. With CGA mode, I took the 16 color Amiga graphics into PaintShop Pro and converted them to four color CGA by hand. Now this was very time consuming, but after several attempts at automated conversions, I just couldn't find a better option. Um, I actually ended up treating the horrid CGA palette more or less like four shades of gray. And so it actually looks really good when played on CGA systems with monochrome screens. In fact, we added a special video mode called CGA Inverted Colors. And what it essentially does is invert these two middle colors. And the reason for this is that I found that some monochrome CGA systems actually have these colors inverted for some reason. And so um, uh, this way you can compensate for that. The Compact Portable is just such an example of a computer that needs this mode. And uh, as you can see, the graphics look absolutely amazing on the Compact, uh, probably better than any other game you could play on this system because the graphics are almost tailor-made uh, for its screen when running in this mode. But uh, even on CGA systems with color screens, I, mean, I think the game looks pretty darn good considering the limitations of CGA. And we do use the background color register to flash the screen colors, for example, when taking on damage or using the EMP. But what about composite mode? Well, I decided we definitely needed a support for that too. And so what I did was start off with the Commodore 128 graphics assets, which is the same screen resolution as CGA composite, and painstakingly converted those by hand to CGA composite. And um, I think they look pretty great. Uh, most of the screenshots you see are captured from DOSBox, but I've always found composite mode looks better on the real thing. So here you go. This is running on a real IBM at 4.77 megahertz using CGA composite. And I bet you won't find many games that look this good or play this well on such a machine. And you get a full color on screen map as well. We also support Hercules graphics, and for some reason I've never cared for the way DOSBox shows Hercules mode. It's very dark and the aspect ratio is wrong. So rather than have you look at this, let me show you Hercules mode running on a real computer with Hercules graphics. It's uh, actually quite playable. Now admittedly, all we're doing here is an automated conversion on the CGA graphics assets. Uh, this could look probably 50% better if we had natively drawn Hercules graphics assets, but uh, I suspect the customer base for this is very small, so it just wasn't worth it. Still, like I said, it looks decent and is very playable. Okay, now let's talk about Tandy support. Um, we didn't go all out with Tandy support on this version like we did with Planet X3. 
It does not support Tandy music, so you'll have to live with PC Speaker unless you install an ad lib in your Tandy. But uh, we do support the low resolution mode, which is uh, based on the Commodore 128 graphics assets. It looks pretty good and is probably the best option for playing on older, underpowered Tandy systems like the 1000HX here. But we also have a mode for the high-end Tandys that use the uh, high-res 16 color graphics. Now, these are automatically down-converted from the VGA graphics. Now, this mode looks fantastic, but uh, I've heard some reports that it's buggy on the real hardware, and we haven't really been able to do all the required testing on those machines since uh, they're a bit hard to get hold of. So, moving along, let's talk about EGA graphics. Uh, this mode is also using an auto-convert system. Now what I did is I started with the VGA palette we're using, which is based on the Amiga 16 color artwork, and just created a conversion chart. It seems pretty straightforward at first because uh, you can take some of the obvious colors like black, white, blue, red, yellow, gray, and brown, and those just convert over to a nearly identical counterpart. But then you run into issues like this. There are two shades of blue here, but only one shade of blue in the EGA palette we can use. So. Both of these, unfortunately, have to map to a single blue. Same issue with these two grays and some of these other colors. So, despite both palettes being 16 colors, we can't do a straight conversion. In fact, I think we're only using about 12 colors in EGA mode. That being said, the end result is still pretty good, and uh, I'm not even sure if we could have achieved much better result by converting it by hand. Also, um, I've bumped us up to AdLib Music at this point, and um, here's what it looks like running on a real EGA system. So yeah, I think it looks pretty good, uh, despite being an automated conversion. Also, you might have noticed uh, in our list of graphics mode, there is the Plantronics Color Plus. Uh, this poor card was uh, never supported by any games until Planet X3 came along. And now there's another game that supports it. Now, I'd love to show you how it looks on the real thing, but my Commodore PC that had the internal Plantronics support has recently had a RAM chip fail, so I don't have a system to show this on. But uh, I don't really need to, and that's because it looks absolutely identical to the EGA version in every way. So if you have a CGA card that supports this mode, the game will look exactly like this. And then of course, there's the VGA version, which is probably what most people will be using. And technically speaking, we're only using 16 colors even here. Uh, the artwork comes straight from the Amiga version, which was designed for 16 colors, but at least we get to have a matching palette in VGA mode, so it looks uh, its best that way. As for sound and music, you really only get two options, which is the PC speaker or AdLib, but uh, we do also support the OPL to LPT, so uh, that way you can have AdLib sound even on systems that don't have any expansion slots. Um, the music system is based on the same code we used in Planet X3, which only used three voices. But here we're using six voices for music and the rest of the voices for sound effects. As for controls, there's only two options. You can play with a keyboard, and if you don't like the default key arrangement, then just like on other versions, you can create your own personalized keyboard layout. Alternatively, we do support one external controller, which I'll show you running on the little tiny Wii C computer here. This is a Gravis gamepad. Um, a traditional joystick for MS-DOS computers was not a good fit for the game. But we realized these Gravis gamepads were quite popular back in the day, and uh, it has enough buttons to actually work pretty well with the game. Uh, so that's the route we decided to go. The MS-DOS version gets its own box, uh, own manual, and also comes with a little robot keychain. And uh, the included disc is a 1.44 megabyte floppy disk. Uh, the game will not fit on a 360k disk or even a 720k disk. So we were going to add some compression routines to try to at least get it to fit on a 720k floppy, but even that proved to probably be a waste of time because uh, I'm actually not able to buy these in the quantities that I need anymore. Um, the supplier I've been using for years, uh, their supply has nearly dried up. And uh, before you go and rush to the keyboard to tell me that I can buy these from floppydisk.com, um, I want to let you know that's where I've been getting them for the last several years. And yes, their supply is nearly dried up, and I cannot get thousands of these from them anymore. So, moving along, let's talk about the Atari 7800 version. Now, I'll preface this by telling you that this entire port was done by Atari Age and a couple of other programmers. In fact, I don't even have this version available in my store, although they are supposed to send me some stock at some point. Now, for those that remember, we released a version a while back for the Atari 8-bit computer systems that ran in monochrome and had no dedicated musical track. Now, these sacrifices were made to keep compatibility with a 48K Atari 800, 
and a single density disk drive. Now in retrospect, I kind of wish we had targeted the high end such as the 130XE instead. And for those wondering how that version would have looked and sounded, well, the Atari 7800 version brings that to life. We adapted the Commodore 128 graphics since they were a good fit for the 7800's graphics capabilities, and Atari Age contracted Noel to create a custom Pokey soundtrack. And while the 7800 doesn't have a Pokey chip, uh, this was used in some games as an add-on inside the cartridge, uh, such as this Ball Blazer cartridge, and so that's basically what we have here, except that it's using a modern recreation of the Pokey chip known as the Hokey. So, there are a few unique features I want to show you, such as the ability to change your player sprite. Uh, the default is called Mike, and you can change it to David, which <laughs> resembles the sprite used in other versions of the game. And last, you can change it to Bruce, so uh, that's a neat feature. Um, and as on most other versions, you can also get a full screen map. Okay, the bad news is, uh, this game is really hard to play with two buttons. I mean, it is possible to do, but it's a clunky control system because you have to press buttons multiple times to accomplish various tasks. It's hard to remember how it all works. Fortunately, every game ships with one of these. You guessed it, um, this allows the game to be played with a Super Nintendo controller, which really just makes the whole thing work so much better. Anyway, maybe someday we'll backport this version to the Atari 8-bit computers, but uh, now it's time to move on to the last official port, the Super Nintendo version. And it feels kind of like coming full circle, because even starting with the original PET version, I had adapted a Super Nintendo controller, and 10 of the 18 available ports actually support Super Nintendo controller as an option, not counting the Super Nintendo itself. So it seems only fitting that we finally have a version of the game that runs on the Super Nintendo directly. Now one nice thing about the Super Nintendo is that it uses a 65816 microprocessor which is backwards compatible with the 6502. Uh, therefore much of the original code from the Commodore version can run as is without conversion. Now naturally the Super Nintendo has better graphics being a 16-bit machine. So again, the Amiga artwork uh, was used. However, uh, the coder here decided to go with a different appearance to the user interface. As you can see, the information is presented as an overlay on top of the playfield. This actually gives us a little bit larger playfield than we would have otherwise. But otherwise, the graphics look pretty much like all of the other 16-bit systems. It does have its own unique audio track though. Um, it's really similar to an Amiga mod tracker as it's composed of all digital samples. And while it has its own unique sound, it is still the same original tunes used from the C64 version. One interesting feature in this version is the map. Now when you open the map, you can use the back left and back right buttons to zoom in or out. The cartridge PCBs are custom made by Texelec, and we have a limited number of shells for both the North American market and the European market, uh, which uses a different shell. Okay, so now I want to talk to you guys about game sales. So I've been doing it for around six years, and uh, this may come as a surprise, but uh, merchandise sales for me is and has always been a losing proposition. Now, I know there's guys out there saying, oh, David's super greedy and he's making a fortune selling these games or whatever. And that could not be further from the truth. So I'm going to tell it to you the way it really works. So um, I'm going to give you this as an example. So I'll sell this game on my website for $35. I actually make about $10 profit for selling this game. That's because the other $25 goes to the material cost and other one-time expenses in getting things like this designed and made. So... $10 is like, okay, well, that's not too bad. But then you start talking about all of the labor of me that I have to do to put these together, make the discs, uh, the, just all the e-commerce stuff and the shipping and, and, and whatnot. And by the time you look at the hours spent, and that doesn't even include my time developing it, um, I'm making like less than minimum wage, uh, probably like $5 an hour if you actually think about it uh, to make and sell these games. So I'm not really making much money there. And now I'm going to tell you another secret. And I've been hiding or keeping this secret for many years. But um, if you buy this game from my website and uh, you are having it shipped to Europe or Australia or New Zealand or someplace, the shipping cost historically on my website has always been $15. Now, the truth is to ship this to Europe costs me $28.00. To ship it to Australia or New Zealand is more like 36. You do the math and what you'll quickly realize is that I'm subsidizing the cost 
of getting these shipped to Europe. Now, you might say, well, why on earth would I do something like that? Well, it's because I, I understand that people in these other countries, the shipping cost is already expensive, and then they're going to have to pay import duties and all this kind of stuff. And I just want people to be able to have access to buy these games at a reasonable price because this is and always has been a labor of love. So yeah, uh, if you bought one of these games and you live in one of those countries, chances are I either broke even or actually lost money for every single game that I've shipped to those countries. And so one thing that irritates the living crap out of me is I will get emails from people who say, hey David, I just bought your game. Um, I don't even have a computer that can run this game, but uh, I just wanted to support your channel by buying it. So I'll look at their order and they're in like Australia and uh, they didn't even pay for an autograph. So what they, you know, and it's not their fault because they didn't actually know, but I'm setting the record straight. Now everybody knows. So, it, you know, when that happens, uh, they thought they were supporting my channel, but in reality, they just took $10 out of my bank account, basically, is what they did. So having said all that, as of last week, I actually adjusted the shipping costs on my website to reflect the actual shipping cost. So uh, going forward, I will not be at least losing money on these games. Now I want to talk about sales figures. I've been sharing these numbers regularly on the Petsky Robots Facebook group, so this is nothing new. These numbers represent the number of online sales of each product that I sell. Now, this does not include in-person sales, such as at conventions, as I don't have any easy way to track that. But uh, I think you could add another 10 or 20% of these numbers to compensate for that. But this is still gives um, a good rough idea of how many I've sold. Now, to put some context with these numbers, uh, Planet X3 has been on sale now for quite a few years, so it has the advantage of time. Uh, these numbers also include the original Kickstarter sales as well. I hope making these numbers available to the world will help people who are considering writing a game for one of these platforms have a better idea of what the market size is on each platform. Now, to be fair, uh, MS-DOS Robots only went on sale like three months ago, and uh, I haven't made a wide announcement about it yet, so sales for that platform are rather underrepresented at the moment, uh, but you can look at uh, Planet X3 to see there's a large base of MS-DOS users. And of course, the Super Nintendo version hasn't even gone on sale yet uh, at the time of making this video, so we can't compare it to the Sega Genesis, for example, but uh, it'll be interesting to see how it fares. And again, you might be looking at these numbers and think even at $10 per sale, it would add up to a lot of money. But considering this spans a six-year period and the amount of labor that went into it, as well as all the sales I lost money on, it really isn't as much money as you might think. So there's something else I want to talk about. So when I finished the first four ports of uh, Petsky Robots, that would be for the Pet, the VIC-20, the C64, and the Commander X-16, I thought, you know, I was done. I thought that was it. But then the Apple guys came along and they wanted to do a port. And I thought, hey, this is pretty cool. So, uh, you know, seeing the uh, game emerge on such a different computer. And then the Atari guys, they wanted to do their port. And that was also cool. And then after that, it just started snowballing. And the next thing you know, I was working on six or seven different ports at the same time. And it was almost like uh, Slurms McKenzie. I was having a party. It was so awesome, this, you know, porting the game to all these different platforms. But it was also an incredible amount of work. So after about the 10th port came out, I was starting to feel a little bit more like Slurms McKenzie after he's all partied out. And the only thing he can say is, I'm so tired of partying. So very tired. And so that's kind of my mental state on it at this point. So when additional people contact me asking about, you know, doing a port for Petsky Robots, I just don't have any enthusiasm left for it. And so I'm just, I'm done with it. Now, having said that, most of the versions have been made open source and you can find them on GitHub. I've even put a link down in the description to the GitHub page. So if anyone wants to do a port on their own time for their own enjoyment, you have my total support. I might even help a little bit with beta testing, but uh, that's it. Now, uh, speaking of open source, I wanted to tell you guys some sad and happy news. Uh, the sad news is Scott Robison, who did the primary coding on the Commodore 128 and C64 REU versions, passed away suddenly and unexpectedly uh, shortly after completing those versions. And the worst part is I didn't even find out until about a month or so later. Um, I'd been calling and emailing him with no response, and I just... I just thought he was too busy to, to talk to me. Um, but then uh, his phone was disconnected and I started to suspect something was going on. So when I found out 
uh, what had happened. I was actually in shock. I mean, Scott and I had become pretty good friends during the development of the game. And uh, anyway, so that's the bad news. Uh, the good news is uh, I talked to his wife and she actually managed to find the source code on his laptop for both versions of the game. And so we were able to put those on GitHub. Uh, so if anybody wants to have a look at those, they are available. Okay, another announcement that I want to make is that I'm probably going to be phasing out merchandise sales completely over the next year or two. So I've got enough stock to, for most products to last through the end of the year. But as things run out of stock, I'm simply not going to restock them. I mean, I just spend an incredible amount of time dealing with the merchandise sales. And as I mentioned earlier, I don't really make much of any money on it. And uh, I would, I would just, I think I would rather refocus that time on making more history videos uh, and working on the Commander X16 project. That being said, I will still continue to offer digital downloads. And for those that want to try out one of the games free of charge, remember I do have shareware versions of most of the ports available on my website. And these are, for the most part, fully functional games. I mean, you do get the little nag screen for a few seconds, and then there's some minor features missing, which vary from port to port. But uh, each shareware version includes two maps. Now, since I won't be doing any more ports, a lot of the people, a lot of people are going to ask, well, what, what about the ports that didn't get finished? Uh, the two that come to mind is the Nintendo 8-bit port and the um, the Tandy Color Computer port. The answer is, I, I don't really know. Both of those versions were already in a playable state. Uh, in fact, the Nintendo version, I would say, was like 90% done. And, um, you know, I'm actually pretty heavily invested. I already spent a few thousand dollars both on getting the musical score made and getting the cartridges designed. And I already had a lot of the materials to build the cartridges and stuff. But at this point, I just, like, even if um, Vile were to email me today and say, hey, it's completely finished, I'd just be like, I'm sorry, I just don't. I just don't have the enthusiasm to go forward with, you know, selling another few thousand products that I'm not going to make any money on, right? So, um, that's just, I'm just laying it out there and being honest with you guys. So that, that's kind of where I'm at on that. Now, having said that, I did talk to Vile the other day about the Nintendo port, and he actually said he is still working on it, and he actually sent me another version that's actually a little bit updated. But I told him, I says, look, why don't we just... Uh, open source it and we'll take the binaries we have and I'll, I'll try to make them available here at some point. And, uh, and, and, you know, I also offered the suggestion if somebody else would like to make and sell the cartridges, I would be okay with that too. Um, you know, so there may be a future for the Nintendo port. I just don't personally want to deal with it. But if you want to find out what happens with that, then I encourage you to sign up for the Facebook page for the Attack of the Petsky Robots because I'm sure I'll be making a post there. Uh, if any developments occur on the Nintendo port. Okay, so now let's talk about prizes. So I said earlier in the video that you might be able to win some prizes by playing Petsky Robots. So I have partnered with Twin Galaxies, and um, what we're going to do is offer some bounties uh, where uh, people who achieve certain goals, uh, such as the fastest run time through a level or something like that, will be able to win some prizes. So I haven't quite figured out what the grand prize is going to be yet. I want it to be something really nice. It's probably worth a few hundred dollars, but uh, I want to be giving away a lot of smaller prizes. So, for example, uh, you might be able to win like a Petsky Robots vinyl album or, or, or something like that. So um, there will be a link down in the description uh, to the Bounties on Twin Galaxies. So if you want to read more about that, uh, just... Look down there, and uh, best of luck to you. And now, I want to talk about the future of Petsky Robots. Mopspear is currently programming a sequel to the game that runs on modern computers, which is called Revenge of the Petsky Robots. And we spent some time talking on the phone, and I told him all of the features I wanted the original game to have, but ended up having to be cut out due to RAM limitations on the PET and VIC-20. And so he's been working on implementing all of those features as well as some of his own that he thought of. But uh, again, I'm not personally involved much in this project, so I'm just as curious as anyone how it will end up. That being said, I may end up programming something similar on the Commander X-16, as I think it's a perfectly capable of running something this complex. But at the moment, I'm currently working on Planet X-16, which is, uh, as you might have guessed, a sequel to Planet X-3, which runs on the Commander X-16. And this time it's mouse operated and it works very similar to a modern real-time strategy game. I'm not planning to sell this, rather it will just be a free game for the X-16 community. The same will be true of a Petsky Robot sequel if I do one on this platform. 
That being said, one of the next videos on my channel will likely be a manufacturing update on the X16 as things are moving along quickly now, and uh, this is me grabbing the first one off the assembly line. I've got a lot to tell you about this, so stay tuned. So that about wraps it up. I know this was a long one, and so thank you for sticking around if you're still here, but uh, that's it. So as always, thanks for watching. Thank you.